And we're going to continue with the eighth chapter of Greenwich by Susan Cooper. Simon, Barney, and Jane are all at the Grey House with Captain Toms, watching the painter of the dark at the seashore. He is doing something incomprehensible with his canvas, but only looking at his canvas, not looking at the area around him. Captain Toms says it means something, but he's not sure what. And we'll pick up at the paragraph break. Hour after hour they watch in turn. At length, after an early supper, they might equally have been called that might equally have been called a late tea. Jane and Simon sat again in the book closed living room with Captain Toms. He puffed contentedly at a friendly smelling pipe, gray hair wisping out round his bald head like a tonsure of some ge of some genial old monk. It'll be dark soon, Jane said, looking out at the orange red sunset sky. He'll have to stop painting then. Yes, but he's still at it, Simon said, or Barney would have come down from the eyrie. He prowled round the room, peering at the pictures that hung between bookcases. I remember these ships from last year. The Golden Hind, the Mary and Evan, the Lottery, that's a funny name for a ship. So it is, said Captain Toms, but suitable. A lottery is a gamble of sorts, and she was owned by gamblers of sorts. She was a famous smuggler's ship. Smugglers? Simon's eyes gleamed. A regular trade it was in Cornwall two hundred years ago, smuggling. They didn't even call it that. They called it fair trading. Fast little boats they had, beautiful sailors. Many a fair trader's boat was built right here in Terwithic. The old man gazed absently down at his pipe, turning it in his fingers, his eyes distant. But the tale of the lottery is a black tale about an ancestor of mine I sometimes wish I could forget though it's better to remember. Out of Polperro, the lottery was a, be a beauty before the wind. Her crew had years of fair trading. Never caught until one day <coughs> a e east of here, a revenue cutter came up with her. Both ships fired on one another, and a revenue man was killed. Well, now killing was a different thing from smuggling. So all the crew of the lottery became hunted men. Tisn't hard to escape capture in Cornwall, and for a while they were all safe. And they might have been for longer, but one of the crew, Roger Toms, gave himself up to the revenue and turned King's evidence, telling them it was a shipmate of his called Tom Potter that fired the dire shot. And Roger Toms was your ancestor, Jane said. He was a poor, misguided fellow. <coughs> The folk of Polperro took him and set him on a boat bound for the Channel Isles so he shouldn't be able to give evidence against Tom Potter in court. But the revenue brought him back again and Tom Potter was arrested and tried at the Old Bailey in London and hanged. And wasn't Potter guilty, Simon said. No one knows to this day. Polperro folk claimed he was innocent. Some even said Roger Toms fired the shot himself but they must have been protecting one of their own, for Tom Potter was born in Polperro, but Roger Toms was a truistic man. Simon said severely, he shouldn't have sneaked on his shipmate, even if Potter did it. That's like murder. So it was, Captain Tom said gently, so it was, and Roger Toms never dared set foot in Cornwall again. From that day until the day he died, but no one ever knew his real motives, some truistic folks say that Potter was guilty, and that Toms gave him up for the sake of all the wives and children, thinking that unless the one guilty man were accused, sooner or later all the crew of the lottery would be taken and hanged. But most think black thoughts of him. He's the, he is the town's shame, not forgotten even yet. He looked out the window at the darkening sky, and the blue eyes in the round cherubic face were suddenly hard. The very best and the very worst have come out of Cornwall, and come into her, too. Jane and Simon stared at him, puzzled. Before they could say anything, Barney came into the room. Your turn, Simon. Captain, do you think I could go and get some more of that super cake? Hungry work, watching, said Captain Tom solemnly. Of course you may. Thank you. Barney paused for a moment at the door, glancing around the room. Watch this, he said he reached for a switch and turned on the lights. Goodness, said Jane, blinking in the sudden brightness. It's got really dark. We hadn't noticed. 
we were talking. And he's still sitting out there, Barney said. Still? In the dark? How can he paint in the dark? Well, he is. He may not be painting what's in front of him, but he's still putting paint on that canvas, cool as a cucumber. The moon's up. It's only a half moon, but it gives enough of a glimmer that you can still see him through the glass. I tell you, he must be stark raving nuts. Simon said, you don't remember the caravan. He's not nuts. He's from the dark. He went out of the room and up the stairs, shrugging. Barney headed for the kitchen to fetch his cake. Jane said, Captain Toms, when will Gummery be back? Well, he has found what he went out to find out. Don't worry. They will come straight to us, Captain Toms heaved himself to his feet, reaching for his stick. I think I might perhaps take a look through the telescope too now. If you'll excuse me for a moment, Jane. Can you manage? Oh, yes, thank you. I just take my time. He hobbled out, and Jane went to kneel on the window seat. Staring out at the harbor, a wind was rising out there. She could hear it beginning to whine softly in the window frame. She thought, he'll get cold out there soon enough, the painter from the dark. Why does he stay there? What's he doing? The wind grew. The moon went out. The sky was dark, and Jane could no longer see the pattern of clouds that had been dimly visible before. All at once she realized that she could hear the sea, normally the soft swish of the waves against the harbor. Yet the harbor wall made a constant low music that was part of life. Being always there, it was scarcely heard, but now the sound of each wave was distinct. She could hear each smack and splash to see like the wind was rising. Simon and Captain Toms came back into the room. Jane saw their reflections ghostly in the window and turned. Can't see him any more now, Simon said. There's no light, but I don't think he's gone. Jane looked at Captain Toms. What should we do? The old sailor's face was troubled, creased with thinking. He tilted his head, listening to the wind. I shall wait a little to see what the weather does, for more reasons than you might think. After that, we shall see. Barney appeared in the doorway, munching a large piece of bright yellow cake. "'Good gracious!' said Jane brightly, to stop herself, listening to the sea. "'You must have eaten the whole plateful by now.' "Hm," Barney said as he swallowed. "'Do you know he's still there?' "'What?' they stared at him. "'I haven't just been stuffing myself in the kitchen. "'I popped out round the back and crossed the road from here to look down the harbour wall. Thought I might, "'Thought he might see the light if I opened the front door.' And he's still there, right where he was. He must really be cracked, you know, Simon. Dark or not. I mean, he's sitting there in the darkness at his easel, still painting. Still painting in the pitch dark. He's got some sort of light. It's only by the glow of that you can see he's there. But all the same, really. Captain Tom sat down abruptly in, the arm, in an armchair. He said half to himself, I don't like it. It makes no sense. I try to see, and there is only shadow. The wind's making a lot more noise now, Jane said. She shivered. Out there you can hear the waves really crashing against the headland, Barney said cheerfully. He crammed the last of the cake into his mouth. Simon said, Is there going to be a storm, Captain? The old man gave no answer. He sat hunched in his chair, staring into the empty fireplace. Rufus, who had been lying peacefully on the hearth rug, got up and licked his hand, whining. A sudden gust of wind whistled in the chimney and rattled the front door. Jane jumped. Oh, dear, she said. I hope Gummery's all right. I wish we'd arranged for some great big signal to bring him back if we wanted him, like Indians and smoke signals. Just a fire you'd need now it's dark, said Barney. A beacon fire. In these parts, Captain Tom said abstractedly. Beacon fires date back as far as the men who always light who have always lighted them. A warning from the beginning of time. He leaned forwards, his hands clasped together over the top of his carved walking stick, and he gazed unseemingly in front of him, as if he were looking back into the endless centuries, oblivious of the room and the children in it. When he spoke again, the voice seemed younger, clearer, stronger, so that they paused in astonishment where they stood. When last the dark came rising in this land, Captain Tom said, it came from the sea, and the men of Cornwall lit beacon fires everywhere to warn off its coming. From Estels to Trecobin to Carnbray, the warning fires sprang from St. Agnes to the Lovely to St. Bellarmine's Tor. 
and on out to Cadbarrow, and Rough Tor, and Brown Willie, and the last was the Velen Drukar, and there the light gave battle to the dark. The forces of the dark were driven back to the sea, and might have escaped that way to attack again, but the lady brought home a west wind, and threw all their hope of escape dry upon the shore, and so the forces of the dark were vanquished for that time. Yet the first of the old ones gave prophecy that once more from the same sea and shore the dark should one day come rising. He stopped abruptly, and they were left staring at him. Simon said huskily at last, Is, is the dark rising now? I don't know, Captain Tom said simply in his normal voice. I think not, Simon. It is all but impossible for them to rise yet, but in that case, something else is happening that I do not understand at all. He stood up, leaning on the arm of the chair. I think perhaps it is time I went out there to see what I can see. We'll come with you, said Simon at once. Are you sure? To tell the truth, Jane said, whatever happens out there, I think we'd rather come with you than stay on our own. Too true, Barney said. Captain Tom smiled. Get your jackets, then. Rufus, you stay here. Stay. Leaving the red dog resentful on the hearth rug, they went out of the gray house and crept down the hill slowly at the captain's painful pace. At the bottom, where the downhill road joined the quay, the old man drew them gently into the shadow of a warehouse. At the back of the harbor, standing huddled there, whipped by the wind blowing from the sea, they could see the painter from the dark not twenty yards from them, at the edge of the sea, the light around him made him clear. As Jane looked at him for the first time, she gasped and heard the same instinctive strangled sound from the others. For the painter had no flashlight to make the pool of brightness that surrounded him. The light came from his painting. The green and blue and yellow, it glowed there in the darkness in great right writhing, seething patterns like a nest of snakes. Seeing it now for the first time, Jane felt an instant dreadful revulsion from the picture, its shape and color and mood, yet she could not take her eyes from it. The man was still painting even now with the wind grabbing at his clothes and tilting his easel toward him so that he had to hold it still with one hand. He was yet daubing away frenziedly with a brush full of these strange, horrible colors.